tableau on the cross. Amen? Amen. I am um, thankful for our music ministry here at Mount Pisgah. We, uh, we have dedicated ourselves to being a church for everyone. Amen? If you like the old-fashioned hymns, you're going to get some of that. Amen? If you like the contemporary praise music, you're going to get some of that. If you like some of that old-time gospel, you're going to get some of that. And we even got our own Fred Hammond here of Elder McTavish. So we praise God for, <laughs> for our music ministry here at Mount Pisgah. Um, I am cognizant of the time. It, 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 is, it is approaching 1 o'clock. I'm going to try to get you upstairs eating by 1.15. Is that okay? So we're going to try to do <laughs> Sister Kendi, that amen was a little loud. <laughs> a, little, a little too much oomph behind that amen. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we're going to try to get this sermon done by 1, 105, and then we can vote on our list of officers and get you up eating. If you're like me, your stomach is growling. And if you're like me, then you need a little bit of a wake up right now. So can we stand to our feet, stretch a little bit, tell your neighbor Jesus loves them, and you do too. But don't lie to them now. Come on now. <laughs> but once your blood is flowing, uh, feel free to sit down. I want to reiterate what uh, Brother Edson Pierre uh, spoke about just a second ago as you uh, are stretching. That we definitely, we, every Christmas season, we want to give back to our community. So we are angels for young people in need. So please make sure that uh, choose a child that you can buy gifts for. And I have those gifts by the banquet. Along with your cards, I was trying to think of something anonymous, sis, that, that I could put in there. But y'all know too much about me. I'm a little too transparent in my sermons. But I, I got to come up with a lie and pretend it's the truth. No, <laughs> I'm just playing. But, uh, but, but remember to bring that as well. Um, today we're going to be in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 as we continue our study of Luke. Before you turn there, uh, let's pause and seek the Lord. In prayer as we prepare to, to, to study his word. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for Mount Pisgah and for the love we share here. We praise you for the visitors that you bring us every single week, and more times than not, they stay, Lord. We thank you that, that, that we are a church who seeks you first, and in doing so, we love on you, we receive your love, and we pass it to everyone around us, Lord. Bless us as we study your word. May we always remember the reason why we have hope is because of you, your life, your death, and your resurrection, Lord. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 9, we will start our study today at verse 18. It's been a couple weeks. Um, you all have had some wonderful words. Uh, Dr. Banda, two weeks ago, uh, definitely had our health emphasis, and we praise the Lord for that. The, the church WhatsApp was buzzing about all the, the good things we learned that Sabbath, last Sabbath, Dr. Jones wasn't even done preaching, and, and people were texting me already, telling me how, how well the sermon's going. I said, I need to get back for that man to take my job. Praise God. <laughs> but we praise God that, that he has blessed us with so many people who are um, passionate about the Lord and have, are so knowledgeable in this congregation. Um, but you remember when we last studied, we, we talked about Jesus feeding the 5,000, right? And remember that the word, it, 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 it told us it was 5,000 men, which means it was probably more like 10, 15,000 people that Jesus fed. We talked about how it was not a diet, life and death situation. It's just they were going to be somewhat uncomfortable, and the people in the towns around them were going to be flooded with more customers than they could feed. And Jesus even had mercy at their inconvenience. Amen? That we serve a God who is even concerned about the little troubles and the big troubles, amen? But we began that with that section. There was something that I love is that, 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 that we had an example of how Luke weaves different things in and out of his gospel. Remember, we talked about how Luke was a PhD, right? Luke did an investigation before he wrote Luke and before he wrote Acts. And Luke writes as somebody who's writing the greatest dissertation ever written. Come on now. There's been some good dissertations written, but if you write a gospel, that is, that is un inarguably the best dissertation ever written. But Luke has different themes he, 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 he weaves in and out. One of them we saw was that Jesus is, is not one who favors genders over the other. Come on now. We see repeatedly that women are lifted up in Luke's gospel. 
In a time when women were downtrodden, he made sure to lift them up in his gospel. People who are outcasted, like the woman with the issue of blood, he, he does not show favoritism to Jairus, remember? Jairus is of the elite. He does not show favoritism to him, but Jairus it really has to wait for his miracle while Jesus helps the woman who has been outcasted by society. There's different themes that Luke weaves in and out of his gospel. And I love what he did at the, at the beginning of the section just prior to what we are studying today. At the beginning of the section where he feeds the 5,000, the really 15 or so thousand, is that he says, Herod starts to wonder, who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? And Herod seeks to see him. But what Jesus makes him do is wait all the way until the trial right before the cross to even see him. When Herod beckons, for, Herod beckons for Jesus, Jesus does not come running. Come on, somebody. And when Herod finally gets, the Bible says, in, uh, when you get home, study it in Luke chapter 23. When Herod finally gets in the same room as Jesus, he answers questions. and Je- I mean, Excuse me, he asks Jesus questions, and he asks Jesus to perform signs. And Jesus is like, I'm no clown on the stage for you. And he basically just stays silent to royalty. But we see in our, our, our verse today, immediately after that section, we get to the section we're going to study today, starting in verse 18, and we see that Jesus is not only willing, but, 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 but he is anxious and excited about showing the lesser in society who he is. The royalty has to wait a minute. But the lesser in society, Jesus goes to them to proclaim who he is. Who do you say I am? We are at verse 18. We're going to take it a few verses at a time. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. It says, now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? Verse 19, and they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Jesus begins with this question, and their first answer is not personal, but what they have heard about him. Who do you say I am? I remember when um, when I was about 20 years old, I had moved out of the house, and I I I was still in the same town as my father lived in, but I moved out of the house, and I I went one time. My dad's a respiratory therapist. Well, he was. He's retired now. But he's a respiratory therapist, and he worked in a hospital. And I went to go visit him to have lunch with him. I got to the hospital, and I sat down, and my dad passed by, and he said, I'll be with you in just a moment. And he went on his his way, continuing his duties. Uh, Well, there's one thing that that has always been interesting is that people of lighter shade don't always recognize the dynamics of biracial children. Did I say that politically correct enough? <laughs> the, <laughs> the biracial children can be, can be, can be as, as, as dark skin or as light skin as God chooses them to be. Come on now. And, and a lot of times there was not a recognition that my dad and I share almost all the same features even though our skin color is completely opposite. So there was this lady who, sat, who was sitting next to me, and apparently my dad had treated her several times before, and she began to talk to me about my father, not knowing that I was his son, and assuming that we shared a lineage. We do to some degree, but you get what I'm saying. And she, she, said, she said, you know, he, he, he's a somewhat nice gentleman. I said, I said, yeah, yeah. I've always had good encounters with him for the most part. And she said, you know, uh, but, you know, he's, 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 he's good at his job, but I don't really like his character. I said, oh, really? <laughs> and she said, yeah, he laughs too much. And some of y'all said that about me. Come on. <laughs> he, 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 he's, he's a little too friendly makes me feel uncomfortable. And then she says, but I guess, I guess he's pretty good at his job for a colored man. 
I said, okay, I said, all right, okay, all right, all right. And um, so he walked up and embraced me. I said, good, good to see you, Dad. <laughs> this eyes lady's turned into this lady's eyes turned into saucers. <laughs> she had an opinion about him from her own uh, encounters with him but not really based on who he is, but really based on her own biases. I had an opinion about my father, not from hearsay and small encounters, but because I know who he is. Spent my whole life with him. I've been with him through the ups and the downs. So there's nothing this lady could say to me about him that would affect my opinion of him. I believe that Jesus is looking for people who do not simply espouse what they have heard about Jesus, but understand who he is because they have lived with him through the ups and the downs. You know, we have an entire church system that is, now what I'm about to say I want y'all to hear me out. That is built so that you will not know Jesus. Christianity is designed, as we have it today, so that you will not know Jesus. You will only hear about him. We have been handed a system where they even had the Bible in Latin for people who do not speak Latin so that only the priestly class could read the Bible and then tell you what it says. There is, if you ever, in lots of, a lot of different parts of the world, there's something they say when people graduate college. They say, you are not authorized to read. Have any of y'all experienced that? I know a lot of places that used to be British colonies still use that. They say, you're not authorized to read. The origin of that is that when people received higher education, because only the higher classes could receive higher education, when people received higher education, they now became part of the elite, they would be taught Latin, and they now were authorized to read the Bible. There's an entire system. Do you know the reason, even though y'all look good this morning, you know the reason why we feel the need to dress up for church? It's because church was designed for the elite. You had to have a little bit of money to get to church. Church is designed so that I come up here and I say something and you believe it. You know, I mean, I, I love y'all, but can I say this? One of the things I, I can't stand the most is when people say, you may not respect the man, but respect the office. No. Listen, if the man in the office is a tyrant, he's a tyrant. If the woman in the office is a tyrant, she's a tyrant. Listen, I don't want you to respect me because I'm the pastor. I want you to respect me because I am a human being. You hear me this morning? Because one day I'm going to retire and I'm not going to be the pastor anymore. I might leave this church and not be your pastor anymore, but I'm still going to be a human being. With desires and needs and flaws out the you know what, like all over flaws but still a human being on the same road as you trying to do the best I can for my Lord and Savior and love people all along the way. And I'm going to get it wrong sometimes. Come on now. We all going to get it wrong sometimes. But we should respect people as human beings. There's, an insist, there's a system that elevates me above you. That's why it has been my mission since, since I started ministry. Not to get up here and preach at you, but to teach you so that if I say something wrong, you can go find out the truth yourself. Come on now. Don't rely on me for the truth. I'm going to try to give you what I've learned along the way. But guess what? I need what you have learned along the way too. An entire system. Do you know that, 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 that in the Bible, what was the qualification for baptism? Paul did it all the time. Believe on Jesus Christ and be baptized. That was a qualification. That's it. We make people memorize an entire 
doctrinal creed that's like this thick, go through 44 lessons, little pamphlets, before we'll let them get in the water. That's not biblical, y'all. The Bible said believe on Jesus Christ and be baptized. The entire system is set up for you to hear about Jesus but not know Jesus. But Jesus encourages his disciple, don't just tell me what you heard about me. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered correctly, the Christ, Christ meaning Savior, Messiah of God. But look what Jesus does. He turns it around. He says in verse 21, he says, and he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Verse 23, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man or a woman if he he or she gains the whole world and loses or forfeits themselves? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. This would have floored the disciples. We understand that their view of the Messiah, even before Jesus showed up, their view of the Messiah was that the Messiah would come and would get rid of this Roman oppressor and would seat himself on an earthly throne and be crowned an earthly king and to rule over their territory and free them from this oppressor. They had political power in their minds. But here Jesus shows up. He's like, yeah, who do you say I am? Oh, you are the Messiah. Okay, cool. I'm going to die, and I need you to die with me. Like, think about that. It would completely floor them, especially if you think about what we have studied about Jesus in Luke, but also in our previous study in John. Jesus was a revolutionary brother. He really was. Doing things, like I mentioned earlier, of uplifting women in a society would push them down was revolutionary. If you remember in Luke chapter 1, before Jesus was even born, Mary's singing a song in which she says, He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Jesus started as a revolution when he was in his mama's belly. Then he shows up and he starts doing things like cleansing temples with ropes and stuff, fashioning whips and pushing out the the, the, the capitalists out, out out of the temple. Jesus is doing revolutionary things, and then he goes up and he says, uh, yeah, I'm not sitting on a throne here. I'm I'm, I'm, going to die. And then he has the nerve to say, and I need you to kind of follow me in that path and do the same. They had a misunderstanding of the cross. They saw the cross as weakness, and it's understandable, because they saw people die on the cross all the time, and it would have been the most weak and, 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 and terrorizing thing that they ever saw. I can understand why they would think like that, but they misunderstood the cross. They did not realize that the cross was the most revolutionary act in history. It was spiritually, politically, emotionally, whatever e revolutionary. It freed captives who had no other means of freedom. It brought down entire political systems. Two of them, eventually. It eventually brought down the, 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 the system of Jewish elite, of Hebrew elite, who kept the people at bay so that the oppressors could, would continue to bestow riches upon them. It brought that system down in A.D. 70. It would later, through his followers, bring down the entire Roman Empire. 
It, 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 it was a revolutionary act. But it also was revolutionary in that Adam did something that could not be undone except at the cross. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most revolutionary act in history. It's why in order for empires to continue their oppression, they have to co-op it and to change its meaning. It was a revolutionary act. But guess what? The same way that the disciples misunderstood the cross, so do we. We often see the cross either as just another one in a long line of doctrinal beliefs, another point in a theological series. The cross is not just one among many. The cross is what all of history hinges on. And if your belief does not mesh with the cross, it is either misunderstood, misconstrued, or it just misses. If what you believe, everything you believe, cannot fit on the cross, in agreement with the ultimate love which was shown on the cross of Jesus Christ, then what you believe is either off or off. We misunderstand the cross. It's not just a point in a long line of things. It is the point of it all. I remember I, uh, um, just, just a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, um, I, see, what, what I'm doing, some of you all, who have been over have seen it, but I'm, I'm undertaking the, the, uh, the, the uh, journey to building a greenhouse in our backyard. Now, I, 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 my job now is primarily mental. I do a lot of studying, a lot of talking. I need sometimes to work with my hands, to build something. So I'm building a greenhouse in our backyard, but I'm, I'm new to this. I'm doing a pretty good job, right, babe? I'm doing, some of y'all seen it, I'm doing all right. She's impressed. That's all that matters. But, but I'm still new to this. A couple weeks ago, on Sunday morning, I get up. I'm working on the greenhouse. I'm like, today's the day I put on the door, and I paint the greenhouse. So I build the door, and I put the door in place. And I go, and I paint the whole greenhouse. And I'm like, OK, I get done painting the side, the top, everything. And I paint the door, and I go through. The windows aren't in yet, so I can go through the other side. I paint the other side of the door. And then I'm like, okay, I got to open the door so that I can paint like the door hinge, right? Like the, the, the inside of the door, the sides of the door. But I had forgotten something. So when I grab the door handle, and now the door's got wet paint on it, black paint. And I pull the door handle, and the entire door just <laughs> right onto me. Covers me, Ella Kennedy, in black paint. Closing everything, just on my face, it's like on my eyelid, everything. I realized in that moment that I had everything built, and it looked good, but it wasn't good because I forgot to put the hinges on the door. Do you know we build our belief system the same way? It looks good. It sounds good. But if, you, if it's not based on the hinge, which is the cross and the resurrection, then it's not good. And not only is it going to fall apart, it's going to fall on you and cause a whole lot of harm. The cross is the point of it all. But they missed it, and we miss it. But I love Jesus because he's, he's merciful to his children who are sometimes ignorant, sometimes just learning. The Bible says in verse 28, it says, Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him. Who? Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, 
which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were, part, were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the crowd, cloud, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything at what had just what they had seen. So Jesus asked them, he introduces this, and he says, Who do they say that I am? They say, The crowd says that you are Elijah or John the Baptist. Herod in the previous section talked about how. The crowd is saying this is a prophet of old. M many uh, um, commentators believe that when he says a prophet of old, he's speaking of Moses. So the rumors are out there that this is Moses, this is Elijah, this is John the Baptist. And, it, and, and Herod clears it up in the last section and says, I, I beheaded John the Baptist. It's not him. But the question is still out there, is this Elijah or a prophet from old? But here Jesus is not only encouraged at the transfiguration, but proof is provided that this is not Elijah. This is not a prophet from old. And the voice of God makes it clear by saying, this is my son. My chosen one. And I love how, how God ends the statement. He says, listen to him. He's not just a man. He's a prophet, but he's not just any prophet. He's the one who healed the woman with the issue of blood, but not just, not just her body, but also her soul. He's the one that resurrected Jairus' daughter from the dead, but also made sure she had something to eat as soon as she woke up. He's the woman, you remember, he, he came away doing a miracle and he saw a funeral procession earlier in Luke with a woman crying because her son had passed away and just out of the kindness of his heart, he's like, let me do another resurrection. He's that Jesus. He's the Jesus of the cross whose love is so all-encompassing that I truly believe the cross was not a reaction but an action. It was an instinct. It's who he is. And I believe that when we see that Jesus, we begin to know him. You know, I, I, it's, it's sometimes a difficult world that, that, we, that we live in. There's a lot of clouds. There's a lot of fog when it comes to spiritual things. When it comes to everything, there's just a lot of fog. And I feel like the two thickest fogs are religion and hard times and good times. <laughs> in good times it's, it's easy to just kind of you're not even trying to look through the fog right like you're just kind of there the fog ain't hurting you so you just kind of live with it a little bit but I believe that to know Jesus even in times when you're not motivated to by difficulties you have to still be seeking him reaching for him even in the good times we have religious systems and none of them are perfect but I I might be I am a little biased I feel like I'm in the best <laughs> but none of them are perfect 
And even if you rely on the best, then you've just heard about Jesus. But it's easy to get on that crutch where you just hear about Jesus. Or I say something, or some professor at some Adventist school, or some GC president, or some, some ministry president, or anybody, says something and you just take it. Someone hands you a pamphlet and it's a it's pamphlet and it's popular. So you just believe it. It was in an Adventist publication, so you just believe it. We even do that with the Sabbath school. Someone questions what's in the Sabbath school book, and it's like they question the word of God, man. That's fog. That's all fog. Jesus is not looking for us to hear about him. He wants us to know him. You know, in in this difficult world in which we live in, the sad reality is that none of us are untouched by tragedy. I don't want to put her on the spot, but man, y'all, the the faith and the resilience that Sister Reynolds has shown, and even getting up and testifying this morning, I, I was trying not to jump up and shout. And we have many stories of that at Mount Pisgah. But the difficult times, we're all all touched by them because we live in a sinful world. But if we allow them to, those can be the moments of growth. They can be massive moments of accelerated growth. But we have to allow ourselves, and I I truly believe this, we have to allow ourselves to shake the religion a little bit. Because we've been taught that it's irreverent irreverent to allow God to be our daddy. What do I mean by that? Sometimes my children get mad at me. You know the best thing you can do for your child when your child gets mad? Ask them why they're mad. And just let them express it. Even if there's a little disrespect involved. Let them express it. Because then you understand. And they understand. And once you come to the understanding, you can get to the healing. I think a lot of times we don't go to God. Because we've been taught that we have to get all the way in some position that we have to call out the names of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We got to speak in King james and every word we say in order to be accepted by the very one who got into dirt, put his mouth on dirt in order to breathe life into us. I believe we serve a God who nine times out of ten says, however you come to me, just come to me, and we'll worry about the rest after. When life gets hard, remember who he is. He's not the one you heard about. He's the one you know. He's not the one standing, sitting on an earthly throne in a quest for power, ready to punish you at every moment. He's the one who naturally, because of who he is, went to the cross and died for you. He's a God who loves beyond what we can understand. Just go to him. He'll take care of the rest after. Just go to him. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus. Lord, we want to see you. Lord, push away the fog. Push away the fog, Jesus, so we can see you for ourselves. Lord, it's not enough. We don't want to just hear about you. Lord, just hearing about you won't take us through the moments when our bodies fail, Lord. Just hearing about you, Jesus, 
won't take us through the moments when we have an entire house full of children to feed, but no money to do it with, Lord. Just hearing about you won't help Jesus when our marriage is falling apart, Lord. Just hearing about you, Jesus, won't hurt when we lose those we love, Lord. Lord Jesus, we want more than just hearing about you. We want to know you. We want to see you. We want to experience you. We want you to hold us, Lord. Wrap us in your arms, Jesus. And even if we get a little mad, Lord, we thank you that you will not reject us. But I believe, Jesus, that those are the moments you squeeze us the tightest, Lord. Thank you that you are a good father, a loving father, who will do us no harm. Thank you, Jesus, that you went to the cross, that you did what we cannot do ourselves and freed us from this monster of sin, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that I truly believe we do not have to wait much longer, Lord. But the day is coming when we'll be able to look our Savior, our Father, our God, our Lord directly in the eyes and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you when I needed you. You were there for me, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for loving me, Lord. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.